My name is John Shanahan, and I was invited to do this by Jeff, and uh, he very graciously asked me to come over and do this. And, and my, <coughs> I was born and raised right up the river from here. Family came here about 1640s, and um, we've been in the marine business since then. Um, also agricultural business, building implements. The courthouse in Easton was built right from our foundry in 1711. And um, family had a hardware store in Easton for a long, long, long time, hundreds of years. And I decided when I was very young that this was just too much culture, too much history to not follow. So I went to a really couple really good schools and got degrees in engineering, business administration, and an MBA. I was 23 when I finished college and uh, immediately got, I had started several years before in the boat building business, boat designing and boat building business. And I'm going to start this off by telling you that this little boat over here, this boat here is very significant to everything that we're talking about. And this boat over here is also very significant. Okay? This is a skipjack. And uh, back in about early, eight, middle 80s, I was fortunate enough to buy a small uh, boat yard here on the Eastern Shore, which built these. I became a skipjack builder. Um, and the skipjack is the symbol of the maritime as, as you know. So what is it about the skipjack that's so vital to this area and to commerce along the East Coast, for that matter, or North America? So we go back and we look at books by Howard Chappelle, who is the Smithsonian naval architect and expert on American craft, classic craft. Well, what it is really about is, frankly, the shape that you see in this Grand Banks hull. See? If you look at this hull carefully, you see that it kind of got a square bottom. This is called a chime. Now, where did that come from? Right here. But how did it get here? It certainly wasn't built. Okay. I'll tell you how it got here. It all started with a guy over here named Jarvis Newman. Jarvis is from Southeast Harbor, Southwest Harbor, Maine. Jarvis went to um, College for Aeronautical Engineering. His father was an electrical engineer, worked for MIT. And his father was um, so involved in the IBM stuff that he had a heart attack. This is way back. I guess it's in the 30s. And the doctor told him he had to quit doing this, and he had to start doing something that he could be relaxed with. So he became a lobsterman in, out of Southwest Harbor. And his son, Jarvis, took up this uh, aeronautical engineering education. But because he was so deeply into the boat culture, he wasn't about to go and build airplanes and helicopters. He came back and started designing boats. And this boat right here is what we call the Jarvis Newman 32. And it is the first model picnic boat that he would build. This particular boat lives over across the way right out that window at a, at a community dock. It is a navy hull with a white fishing gun. And it is one of these very hulls right here. And Hinkley decided to get into the powerboat business in the 70s, early 70s. So, or it could have been in the late 60s. So they commissioned, they hired Jarvis. Jarvis went to work with him when he designed this boat, and 
this boat is really called the Higley Newman. And it's actually a 36 foot version of the 32. And then Higley found that they needed a bigger design and they reached out to another main designer and got a 42 foot boat. Actually a 40 foot, 39 foot, pardon me, a 39 foot boat made, to which they stretched out to 42. And during this time, the same period of time in the 70s, there was another designer who was a friend of Jarvis's. And this man, his name is Kenneth Smith. And Kenneth Smith designed boats like this, like Jarvis. And this hull over here is a combination. It's a boat that is designed by Jarvis Newman, Kenneth Smith, Raymond Hunt Jr., and John Shanahan. Four of us did this boat right here. And this boat is a little bit more advanced version than this because of the underbody and its ability to go faster, but at a price. It's this model here. It's this shape that has the nicest motion choppy water at low to moderate speeds. And then there's another designer that came out of this same school of thought. He got his degree from Harvard in design, and he's partner with a guy named Ray Hunt. His name is John Dexel. These guys designed this book right here. And this is the classic Hunt East Bay Hall, of which Grand Banks built 150 38 footers, 150 43 footers, about 50 some 47 footers, and maybe 60 54 footers, and one more model. Um, 58 footers, but this basic hull, um, and I, I have to tell you that in the 70s, early 70s, I became a dealer for Grand Banks. So, and I also knew Jarvis and became partners with him later on. So this boat, this East Bay, has been extremely successful because it can do higher speeds than that hull over there. That hull kind of goes along with the movement but this boat is capable of cruising in the 20s. Um, it's actually a heavy displacement boat. It's not a light displacement boat. And so for a minute, we'll just back up a little bit and say, well, how did this Grand Banks hull come into it? Yeah. OK, so I explained that it's a hull shape that's very similar to traditional craft that we see along the North Atlantic coast particularly here in the Chesapeake Bay. Now, in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, this is more known as what they call a Drager hull, D-R-A-G-G-E-R. -G -G -E and a Drager hull is a work boat that accompanies the big fish boats that they throw the fish in. And then they get back from the banks with this hull full of fish. So it was true that when Kenneth Smith was designing round bilge boats like that one for Grand Banks back in the 60s that were being built in Hong Kong, he and the Grand Banks people came up with the idea that in order to produce these things in these numbers that they wanted to produce them, numbers that are commensurate with what I just told you about this boat's production, that they needed something that was eminently more manufacturable than that shape, or even this shape. This is a really modern shape for a Down Easter. This is a really true Down Easter. This is a type of a Down Easter, but they're all Down Easters. So it was it was possible that Kenneth Smith gave Grand Banks two 36-foot designs. 
And one of them is a round bit. And it just so happened that when Jarvis and I were working on this and getting some help from these other guys, Jarvis bought from himself a, an abandoned boat that was abandoned in his boat yard in Southwest Island, of all places. And this boat was, in fact, the alternate boat that Kenneth Smith had designed for Grand Banks. It's the alternate hull that has the round bottom like that. So Jarvis was able to buy this boat. And then he owned it. And then we were able to take the lines off of it and study it. And it gave Genesis partially to this. But so did the hunt. So now we'll go over and we'll talk about how the influence of this North American craft resulted in the Grand Banks, which frankly is in terms of production, which I studied as much as I could. There is no boat or line of boats that has really exceeded Grand Banks' production. So, and I would say that both been in the upper quality range. There, there's, there's some lower quality boats out there. We all know that, but they're not going to live to be 100. Now, the fiberglass Grand Banks have already lived to be 50. My business today is upgrading them and repowering them to keep them going because their, their design is good, construction is real good, as long as they're taken care of reasonably well, they will live to be on. So here's how it happened. Kenneth Smith came up with this design, similar to that. And he came up with a design of a Drager type boat. And Grand Banks looked at it, and the Chinese looked at it, and they all decided, they were going to have a hell of a lot easier time building this because it's kind of square. And it's easier to build a box than it is a balloon, you know? So that's what they did. They chose this for the volume. Now, OK, let's talk about the volume now and why it's important. Now, this boat over here, this original down Easter, we call it, is very pretty. And it's long and skinny. And it is very easy going through the wedge. But you have to be really short and skinny to live inside it. It's not that comfortable. So what did I do? Jarvis and I talked about this. And we needed a boat that wasn't, you know, built for somebody who wore a hat like this. You know, these, these are fishing boats. These guys lived it. This is what Jarvis's dad went out in and became a lobsterman and lived to be a hundred. But it's he they didn't they didn't go cruising in this. They would go out for the afternoon and go out and get lobsters, but that was it. There was no light there. So what we need, what we really need is a boat that has the right layout. Now there's a common thread between this hull and that Grand Banks over here. And the common thread is in the layout. So this is a drawing. And this shows a construction plan where this is a section of this, looking at the side of the boat. And you see the shape of this cabin house. And I will tell you, this cabin house here is totally borrowed from Kenneth Smith. This hull is completely Jarvis Newman. This layout is classic Grand Banks, which came from me. When we started this project, I said to Jarvis, look, this is about 20 years ago. I said, Jarvis, I want a boat that I can be comfortable in when I am older than 65 and under 95. And he said, well, how big a boat do you think that's got to be? I said to Jarvis, it can't be over about 33 feet. 
34 feet. And he said, okay, well, and what's next? And I said, well, but I still have to have the comfort that we get in this Grand Banks. I want a place for my wife and I to sleep comfortably. She wants a shower in the morning in a shower stall that's made out of Corian. She wants a galley that's got plenty of storage for food. She does, doesn't want to go. She's been to Yosemite. She's going to go with me on the boat. She wants to be comfortable. So there's, we know from our Grand Bank sense, really, let's talk about stunning results we got. In the 32-foot Grand Banks, they built a 1,000. In the 36-foot Grand Banks, they built a 1,000. In this 42 Grand Banks, they built 1,555. In the 46-foot Grand Banks, they built over 300, close to 400. In the 49-foot Grand Banks and the 52, they built 200. And those are pretty stunning numbers. And that's because people fell in love with the plans. So what I did is this. I took all the Grand Bank layout and the East Bay layout, and I took them and I broke them down into the ones that were most ordered. And I went to my designs that I helped to work on and picked out all of these various layouts, the layout for the bathroom, the layout for the aft head, the layout for the forward cabin if it's a forward cabin, the, the layout for the settee, the layout for the flybridge, the layout for the helm station, the galley up or down. And they, we did these all in, took the Grand Banks layouts right out of the brochure, got the half inch to one inch scale drawings, which were in my office, and that's what you see over here. We plug them in. I told Jarvis to plug them in, but they're limited to 33. He argued with me. And I said, OK, I'll go to 34. Well, he, Jarvis, and our other architect friend, who I paid to do all the drafting on this thing, his name, Royal Gold. This is a book called Boat Building Down East, How Lobster Boats Are Built by Royal Lowe. And so he and Jarvis sat around for a year trying to figure out how to make this work. And one day they came to me and they said, Johnny, we can make it work, but 35 feet on the waterline. That's as small as we can do it. But they did it. So here it is. Here's what we have. We've got a nice helm seat like a Grand Banks 42. And Mr. Sarnowski, he knows what I'm talking about because he knows exactly every component in this lab. Here's the down galley. You know, here's the V-berth setup. And you've got a big open salon so you can have upholstered chairs and a pop-up TV. Right there. There it is. All in a 35. This says, and the draftsman who did this for Royal Lowell, because Royal Lowell at that point had passed away, but his partner, his partner's name is Elliot Spalding. And Elliot did this engineering for us. And Elliot knew that I couldn't specify in this particular layout, because I've got a whole roll of layouts here. So Elliot knew that I couldn't tell him exactly whether I wanted a settee over here, or I wanted upholstered chairs, or I wanted a curved settee here, or I wanted something else. But he knew that the guts of the boat is this. We're building a boat for people who have been boating their whole lives and want to live on it and be comfortable on it. And it's a little condo for them. But it's a lot easier to live than this little skinny pack here. Right. So 
that's what that's where we went and that's where the down east stuff started and that's where we are today and that's where we're all going so if anybody has a question we have to answer. is that both being produced or you plan to produce it i have a okay so i'll tell you that story that's very interesting i decided that i wanted to build this boat and it was like 2004. In 2004, I took a trip to Singapore because one of my customers who had one of these 49-foot East Bays, he wanted a big East Bay to fit the end. And another customer who had a 43 East Bay wanted to fit the end. And one guy was at top executive in Lehman, and the other guy was a top executive in um, Merrill Lynch and Dion. And these guys kept peppering me for pictures and information on the 58th. So finally, in the spring of 2004, I got on an airplane, went over to Singapore, and spent a week over there. Because they had just built four of these, and they were getting ready to deliver. And they were doing sea trials and inspections, and they invited me to come and be part of the inspection. So I did that. When I came back, so one week later, I stayed over in Newark, went into New York, had lunch with the guy from Lehman, and he was no longer interested. His whole demeanor changed, Joe. He wasn't interested in talking about it. He wasn't even interested in talking about his own book. He just wanted to know how my wife and kids were, my mother was doing, all this stuff. And I said, you know, there's something's changed here. Well, I later found out that later in 2004 that, and the, and the Merrill Lynch guy was the same way. So one of the things that boat builders can't cope with is a thing called a recession. So whenever there's a hint that there's an economic failure on the horizon, be it the Fed getting their interest rate policy wrong, or some other crazy thing like a housing debacle. Boat builders, they draw back because they know the risky time is coming. So, 2004, you know, I'm, this, this hall was made in 2004. These plans were completed in 2003, I went on a trip to find a builder for this boat. Graham Banks didn't want to build it because, and they knew there would be bigger models, but they didn't want to build it because they frankly had enough going on, and they wanted to build ever and ever bigger and bigger and bigger stuff. And when I brought up the potential of the economic change occurring, they say, look, we can't contemplate that, we can't plan for that. I said, that's fine. So I went on a trip with my mom. I took her to Ireland. And my sister came over and stayed with her and went around Ireland some more. I went to um, Turkey after having gone to Poland. Ted Hood told me there was a yard in Poland that could build this where a guy could really do a job. Yeah, there was a builder in Poland. And I went to Gdansk and I looked this guy up, but he wasn't that well organized for me, so he told me about the place in Istanbul. So I got back on a plane and went over to Istanbul. Same trip. And met this, these people, and they built this boat called the Viking. It's a V-I-C-E-M, you're good. And this particular man, his name is Herman Eggy, and Eggy did custom work for subcontract right? And Eggy had a line of boats that were really classic down easters that he distributed in Holland. And that's a real boating town. That's a real boating area. These people are really boats. So when I got together with Eggy, we agreed that he would build a boat for us. Now, we, all, we had had a boat at that point. And what I decided, because of the potential for the economic thing, was to take 
one of Jarvis's existing boats, the 32, and have Mr. Spalding here scale down some of the layouts that would work in that and apply this same architecture, same look, same shapes, etc., to this existing tooling, build this thing out of core cell, which is a really good composite foam, very tight. And it's the only Newman boat ever built out of core cell or any kind of foam or any kind of composite. And all the rest of them were all hand laid up west, the one across the way over there. Um, so I had this boat made by Jarvis up in Maine. And they trucked it down to us. And we put it in our shop, in our boat building place of trap. And then executed a mock-up completely, exactly according to these plans. And then we put the thing on the water. We painted one side blue and the other side white. And we painted, you know, it, put it on the water and did sea trials with it, tested it to see if it would work right. It did. Towed it around behind the grab banks for a while. And got plenty of pictures. And you can't tell that from the actual boat that was built. I mean, it's so exact. Wonderful. So Herman Eggy came over to Trap and from Istanbul and spent a day with us going over the mock-up that we had made. And we had everything there, exactly the way this eighth-inch plywood, which is exactly the way we wanted it. And we had a good movie producer video the entire process of assembling this boat. And so it was all put together in a package and put on a, sh a, a trailer we had, what's it called, a hydraulic trailer. Just drove it up to Baltimore, put it on a trailer. Went on a Turkish, <coughs> no, an American troop ship going to Turkey to supply the, the troops in Iraq. And we got a terrific price on it because the ship was empty. And they took it for practically nothing, which was wonderful. We get it over to Eddie. He executes this thing. And, um, and we get the boat back the following year. And I literally took it off the ship in New York. It's on my trailer. Towed it over to Norwalk, Connecticut. Put it in the water, put it in the Norwalk ship, just to see what people would say. And there were at least a dozen people who wanted to buy that boat back for the Because they're how would we sell it? We, if we have a model, you know, why would we sell it? And if you're going to go into production, you want to keep something so people can see what you're doing. And by late 2005, it was perfectly obvious to me that we were going into a recession. So I decided to cover the boat up, and I still have the boat, and I concentrated on the rest of the business you know, since then. And, and, and now I'm looking for the opportunity to do this. Because, as we all know right now, boats are scarce. They're extremely expensive. It's hard to get them. So the timing is better. But for me, age 74, am I ready to, to do this again? Probably not. I've probably gotten to the point where I've had a lot of fun had a lot of boats. I've been a lot of places. And it's nice. Um, but I don't know whether I want to fight the battle of another production line. Because it's hard work. It's very hard work. But this is basically how it all works. And you, you get an idea, and you test it, and you test market it, and you find out whether people like it. And, but I do know that the market for pe people between the ages of 65 and 95 is the best boat market. And you'd be surprised how many people who are in that age group um, will be interested in this you know, if we do figure out a way to do it. So, you know, there you go. Any more?
question. Thank you. by Tony Fleming. Now, Tony Fleming is a British guy who went to a good polytechnic school and got an engineering degree in England and went to Hong Kong um, as an industrial salesman and then bumped into the boatyard that was building these out of wood. And this is in the 60s when they first started building these boats out of wood. They built the boats in glass in 73. But they didn't have this boat in glass until then. So Tony became a production manager for Grand Banks in the 60s. And he stayed a production manager from about the mid-60s to the mid-80s, about 20 years. And then one day, he had a management disagreement with um, Grand Banks, and he's out of a job. And the management the CEO of Grand Banks at the time wanted to keep his job, but the board wanted Tony to have the job. That's the fact, and it's what Tony says in the book. <coughs> and the board voted the other guy out. They wanted an engineer as a CEO. They wanted Tony. But at the last minute, one of the board members relented, and the guy kept his job, which meant Tony. Now that guy was wanting to get some more stuff. Because you see, back in those days, Grand Banks was, was like a recovering alcoholic. Because in the early 70s, when they decided to go into fiberglass, they needed a huge amount of capital to convert this production line, 32, 36, 42, 46, 48, 49, whatever, from fiberglass, from wood into fiberglass. And of course, these larger boats were being built in Hong Kong. And the smaller ones were being built in Singapore because in the mid 60s, they built, they established a yard for the smaller boats in Singapore. And they did because of the education quality of the Singapore people and because of the laws there because of the availability of capital and because it's crazy. A Maryland company called D-Scan Furniture was started in Maryland which picked up furniture designs from Denmark and manufactured this, these chairs and tables and stuff in Singapore and imported them into the United States, and they were doing about 15 million a year in this stuff. They had this D-scan factory in Singapore, and the Grand Banks people were drawn to the style of this stuff and the quality of the finish. And yes, D-scan, Grand Banks D-scan, Danish modern interior what you're getting with the Grand Bank. And of course, by application, you get it on the East Bank. And of course, by application, to some degree, you would get it on the Fleming, right? Because 
Tony's done it. So that's how all this stuff evolved. So Tony, Tony is over there, and Bob Livingston um, is a really great guy, but on this thing he made a boo-boo. Um, so when they, when, they, when they borrowed a lot of money from a Nevada corporation, through it, they, they established a Nevada corporation, they borrowed tens of millions of dollars, ten million dollars, I guess, to do the tooling on this boat line. And, John, excuse me, if I could just make a suggestion, this is marvelous, I love it, but um, we have the Grand Bank session also scheduled at 1 o'clock. So if you want to take a few more questions and then take a break, if we can. Well, well, we'll talk about this and see if anybody shows up. Okay. They won't. They will. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I'm telling you guys about the story about how all this happened and, and how I got it. Um, so they are they, they established a Nevada corporation and sold these bonds. And the bonds used the molds as collateral. And 73 was the inception of the production. And I was on the boat, the first boat, which is the 36 footer, at the Annapolis Power Boat Show and sold that first part of the boat. But uh, the next day, we had the Yom Kippur War. And everybody knows what happened. The Arabs raised the price of the oil times five. There was no gasoline, there were lines. And that's when I learned, hey, when this stuff happens, you run for the hills, um, unfortunately. Um, fortunately for me, um, the boat was sold. That particular boat was sold, and I didn't have to finance it. So, but 73, 74, 75, three years later, brand banks, by that time, you see, when they got the $10 million, not only did they build up tooling, but they went around, they were convinced from their experience of selling the wooden boats that this trawler thing was really going to fly. So they bought, with the, some of the capital that they raised, they bought a boat yard in Slidell, Louisiana, right next to the port. They bought a boat yard in Baltimore. Right next to the port. They bought a facility in California, Southern California, Newport Beach. They bought a couple of trucks to move them around. They had this thing all figured out. So when the panic, the financial panic came in 1973, everything stopped. Production stopped, cash flow stopped. The bond payments, however, had to be kept. It got so tight that by 1975, they could no longer even by producing wooden boats in Hong Kong, they couldn't keep it going. They could sell their little wooden, they could sell some fiberglass grand banks from Singapore, 32, 36, 42. They could do that in 74. In 75, they stopped building in Hong Kong. They actually had to abandon with 11 boats on the production line, which gave rise to an Alverson senior, Lars Alverson, who at the time lived in Australia. He became partners with Joseph Kong. Joe Kong had been the person who took over after Tony Fleming in Hong Kong. And he's a wonderful engineer himself. And he was sent as a young person by the US Army to MIT after World War II, and his family were native Chinese, and when he was 11 years old, he went on a march, the march with his mother into 1,000 miles into China to escape the Japanese. So when these people all came back together, 
And when the 70s started to roll around and the Chinese government started to open up that area near Hong Kong, which is called Shenzhen, they gave, they went to Joe Kong and said, look, we'll build you a boatyard if you will staff it and build some boats there because we need the skills. See, because they had literally killed off everybody in the war. But Mao was gone, it was a new day. And that's how Kong and Halvers came out. So it's all related. It. But back to the story of the finance, which is the most interesting of all. So we have this financial panic. And a holding company out of London called Inchicate Barrage owned a lot of these bonds, these production bonds. So they effectively became owner of American Marine, which built their very much. So the trustee for the bonds is the Citibank in LA. And they sent two accountants out to Singapore to unravel this mess because they felt that the bondholders in the US, they had to be represented. And that this holding company out of the London, even though they had more bonds, looks like they were going to walk off of it. So what really happened was the two accountants got in there and could see it was a viable enterprise. They made a deal with the case so that the four top guys, the two accountants, that would be the CEO, the financial director, and Tony, production manager, and a guy named Dick Lowe, who was the sales manager. <clears throat> These four guys got, between them, 49%. HK got 50%, 51%. And they started a new company um, at that point in early 1976. And in order to get capital, to build boats, they asked me if I would buy their inventory app from them that they had on the East Coast, which is about four or five boats. And I got lucky because I happened to be in a position at the right time, had access to the capital. That's how we, you know, Grand Banks went out of the business of being in the marine business and just to both of them. So then later, 10 years later, down the road, because the production was so good and the numbers were so high, all that $10 million was paid off. And because their financial director, Ben Brain, is a genius, did an IPO in Singapore. And the Singapore people really respected Grand Banks. So they invested in the company. They raised a huge amount of money. And Everything went forward beautifully, except, of course, Tony had to go, right? Right. So Tony sold his stock to Livingston. It's not in that book that way, but I know what happened. He sells his, like, 12.5% or whatever it is, 12% to Livingston. Livingston gave him a boat, let him build his own boat. And he let him have the plans to another one of Grand Banks' production line models called the Alaska, <coughs> which was designed by a West Coast designer. Two West Coast designers designed that boat. One of the Alaskans was designed by Art Fever. The other one was designed, designed by Bob Doris. Bob Doris went on to become the designer of the Fleming. And Tony. The most fascinating story, that you, the, a good story to read about a great guy is this story here, Roddy. Tony is a really good engineer. He's a hard worker. He's a straight shooter. And he's got unquestionably the best reputation now for the highest quality that is coming out of the parties. And, you know, he deserves it because he really, he's worked out. Grand Banks, on the other hand, when that management got to the point where they had their 30 or 35 years in it and guys were looking for different things to do, eventually Grand Banks sold itself 
to a young, tough, smart, capable Australian by the name of Matthews, Richard Matthews. And this guy has a little company, had a little company called Palm Beach. And Grand Banks recognized, the board did, that this guy needed to be part of them. So they bought Palm Beach and hired him to be the CEO. So they needed, what they needed was new management. And it was a very smart move because throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s, every time I went to Singapore to check up on boats being made, there were Australian boat builders there coaching, leading, and working with the locals, Singaporeans or Malaysians, Grand Banks at that point, the mid 90s had moved into a new factory in Malaysia because Singapore real estate had gotten very valuable. So, so it was the Australians who were really the base of the strong role models in both of them and could teach these locals. So when they bought Palm Beach, not only did they get a product to build, which is a similar product to an East Bay, uh, but a more rounded hull. See, so we're kind of going back a little bit. But they got this new CEO who is brilliant and very, very focused. They got this product, but they also got all these Australians who would come in and be leaders in this plant. So the Americans are no longer, it's a it company originally started called American Marine in Hong Kong, by Americans. This no longer occurred, it's now Australia. And that's, that's pretty much the end of the story. John, who's the author of that book? Huh? That book about Fleming, who's the author? Tony Fleming. Well, he's...